Welcome to the first lecture of this week. Remember last week we have learned about how the concept of invariance can be used in order to be able to obtain simple representations for linear transformations. So what we did was if we can actually decompose the whole space Cn into some invariant subspaces. So I have M2 going until Mk and if each Mi is invariant under A under A and here I have for all I then we have learned that we can actually obtain for, for a matrix A which might be quite complicated filled with, filled with many non-zero elements we can actually obtain a block diagonal representation for this matrix A1 bar, A2 bar going until A k bar these are its, its blocks and everywhere else is equal to zero. And we have learned that actually these AI bars are in C and I by N I. Okay? And that uh, and here N I's are the N I is the dimension of the I subspace. Okay? So this was our basic theory that we have learned. Today we are going to use uh, make an application see the see an application of this this theorem. Okay? So here I would like to ask you what happens when I have here n subspaces m1, m2 going until mn. Okay? And I know that the dimension sums of these subspaces should be equal to n. Therefore, if I have n such subspaces, invariant subspaces, then the dimensions of this one should be 1, dimension of this one should be 1, and dimension of should, this one should be 1. So all the dimensions should be 1, and their sum is equal to the n, the overall dimension of the space. Okay? And what would happen in such a case? So what would be my new representation here? A bar. In that case, of course, there would be n blocks. So I would have A bar is equal to, I have A1 bar, A2 bar, going until A n bar. And what would be the sizes of these blocks? they would all have size one by one because of the dimensions here okay so in that case i have a i bar is in c one by one which is which is c itself so these are just complex numbers these blocks are now complex numbers and what does that mean for a bar and in that case i can actually say that a bar is diagonal okay so we, we have the ultimate simplicity about this new representation, which is, which is a diagonal matrix. Okay? A very, very simple representation we can obtain in this, in this specific case. So now I'm going to, I'm going to show you such a, such a case. So when we, we are going to see that when a matrix has distinct eigenvalues, so no eigenvalue is, is repeated. In such a case, we will see that we, have, we can have such a diagonal simple representation. Okay? So let me illustrate this concept with an, with an example. So our example is this A matrix. So I have 1, minus 1, 0. 0, 2, 0, and 0, 1, 3. This is our matrix, and in this case, I'm going to look at its eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So as I told you before, you need to know how to take the determinant of an arbitrary size matrix in this course. So I will just here illustrate the, the procedure, but I will go over it quite, quite fast. So if you don't remember or if you don't understand here, you need to go back to your earlier linear algebra courses and, and you need to check how to take the determinant of an arbitrary size matrix. So here, in order to be able to calculate the determinant, I will calculate, in order to be able to calculate the eigenvalues, I will first calculate the characteristic polynomial. We know that this is determinant as i minus a, and I would have here 
the matrix SI minus A is given as follows. S times identity matrix, so I would have S minus 1, 0, 0, uh, and, my, and I would have 1 here, S minus 2, and I would have minus 1, and I would have 0, 0, S minus 3. Okay? So we have this type of SI minus A matrix. And now I need to calculate its determinant to calculate the characteristic polynomial. Okay? It's going to be a third order polynomial, so we will have three eigenvalues. And in this case, you might remember that you, you can put these plus minus signs on these, on these elements. And in order to be able to calculate the matrix determinant, you can use any column or any row here. Okay? And it is advantageous to use columns or rows with uh, as many zeros as possible. So, so here, I directly see that if I use the first row of this matrix, then I can actually see that I, I can actually calculate the determinant quite easily because there is only one non-zero element here. So the determinant SI minus A would be I have plus sign here, plus S minus 1, and then I will remove this column and this, ro this, this row and this column from this matrix. It is going to be S minus 2, S minus 3, minus 1, and 0 here. And whatever I do afterwards, so I have minus 1, uh, so because of this minus 1, minus sign here, times, times I would have 0, and I would have I would have another matrix, 2 by 2 matrix here, coming here. But it, since it is multiplied by 0, it's not really important. And I have plus 1 because of this plus sign here, times 0 times another matrix here, which is not important again. Okay? So we have here, this is going to be my determinant, so S minus 1, and I will take the determinant of this smaller matrix, 2 by 2 matrix, and you see that its determinant is S minus 2 and S minus 3. Okay? So this is our characteristic polynomial. Now I'm going to equate this to 0. So this is going to give me the characteristic equation. Characteristic equation of a matrix is nothing but d of s equals to 0. So in this case, we have the characteristic equation given by this expression. Okay? So what are the eigenvalues? So I have lambda 1 is equal to 1, lambda 2 is equal to 2, and lambda 3 is equal to 3. So we see that all eigenvalues are distinct from each other. There is no repeated eigenvalue for this matrix. Okay? So this is, this is a good thing we are going to see that. This is going to result in a diagonal simple matrix representation for this, for this linear transformation A here. Okay? But first I'm going to calculate the eigenvectors corresponding to these eigenvalues. So now let us look at the first eigenvalue. In order to be able to calculate the first eigenvector, I will calculate a minus lambda 1 identity. Lambda 1 is 1, so this is a minus identity here. So I will subtract 1 from the diagonals of this matrix. And it is going to give me 0 and 1 and 2 on the diagonals. And everywhere else it's going to be the same. 1, 0, 0, 0, 0. Okay? And in order to be able to find the eigenvector of this matrix corresponding to the eigenvalue 1, I need to find a non-zero vector inside the null space of this matrix. The first question that I'm going to ask is, what is the rank of this matrix? How many linearly independent columns does this matrix have? So here I see that we have two linearly independent columns, or these two, or these two, and we see that the rank of the matrix, dimension of range space of A minus identity, is nothing but two, number of linearly independent columns. So what is going to be then the dimension of the null space of this, this matrix, dimension of null space of A minus lambda 1 identity. It should be 1 
according to the rank nullity theorem. Remember the summation of the dimensions of the null space and range space should be equal to the number of columns, which is the, the domain dimension for a linear transformation. Okay? So in the null space, there is, there is a single non-zero vector in the, in the basis set. Okay? Now space of A minus lambda 1 identity, I would have span off a single non-zero vector. So tell me a non-zero vector which is inside the null space of this matrix. So you see that if I sum the first two columns here, then I would get just a zero column vector. So and a non-zero vector, which would be inside the null space of this, this matrix, would be 1, 1, 0, which is going to sum the first two columns, which is going to give me the zero vector. So this is my first eigenvector. E1 is equal to 1, 1, 0. And null space of A minus lambda 1 identity is the span of this single eigenvector. Do you think this null space is invariant under A? The result, the answer is, is, is yes, and because this is a null space of a polynomial, a null space of polynomials of A are always invariant under A. And we see that the dimension of the null space is, is 1. Now let us go to the other eigenvectors. So I will look at A minus lambda 2 identity. And lambda 2 is 2, the, that is the second eigenvalue. And I'm going to subtract 2 from the diagonals of this matrix to calculate that matrix here. So let me subtract 2 from the diagonals, minus 1, 0, 1 here. And the rest is the same, 0, 0, 1, minus 1, 0, 0. And now I'm going to look at the null space of this matrix to find eigenvector or eigenvectors. Okay? For every eigenvalue, for every distinct eigenvalue, there is at least one uh, linearly independent eigenvector. Okay? But I don't know really if there are more or, or not. Okay? So here, the, what is the dimension of the range space? What is the rank of this matrix? A minus lambda 2 identity. And in this case, the range space dimension, the rank of this matrix is the number of linearly independent columns, which is just 2. So this tells me that the dimension of the null space of A minus lambda 2 identity should be 1. So I have again a, I have again a one-dimensional eigenspace. This was the eigenspace for the first eigenvalue, and the eigenspace for the second eigenvalue has dimension 1 again. So if I write this null space, a minus lambda 2 identity is going to be span off a single non-zero vector. And tell me a non-zero vector which would be uh, in the null space of this matrix. So we see that the second column is already 0. So if I multiply this matrix with the vector 0, 1, 0, then that is going to give me just 0. So this vector is a basis vector for the null space of that matrix. And that is that tells us that this is my second eigenvector. Okay? So E2 is 0, 1, 0. And the null space dimension, the eigenspace dimension, is again 1 here. Now let me write, write the third matrix, A minus lambda 3 identity. And in this case, I need to subtract 3 from the diagonals of that matrix. And that is going to give me minus 2 and minus 1 and 0. The rest is the same, minus 1, 1, 0, 0, and I have 0, 0 here. And what is the dimension of the range space? What is the rank? It's the same question. Now the three identity is two. Two linearly independent columns. That means that dimension of the null space of this matrix, which is the eigenspace, would be one. So I have, again, null space of A minus lambda three identity would be the span of a single non-zero vector. And in this case, I can easily see a non-zero vector. If I sum the last two columns here, I get the zero column vector. So that means that if I write the vector 0, 1, 1 here, that is going to be my eigenvector. So the third eigenvector is 0, 1, 1, and this null space is given like this. Okay.
So now I'm going to look at look at the look at the, the the summation of these invariant subspaces. Okay, I know that these all of these null spaces are invariant under A because they are null space of a polynomial of A. Okay, and what is the summation of these two these three subspaces? So I will look at null space of a minus lambda 1 identity plus null space a minus lambda 2 identity plus null space a minus lambda 3 identity. Okay? What is the summation of these, these three subspaces? By asking the summation of subspaces, I am asking about the vectors which can be written as the sum of three vectors. The first one coming from this one, the second one coming from this, and the third one coming from the third eigenspace. What type of vectors I can write as a linear combination of these three eigenvectors? Okay? And your answer should be here, just, just C3. I can write any vector in C3 as a linear combination of those three vectors in the, in the basis sets of these null spaces. Okay? And these, these vectors are actually linearly independent as well, so that means that this is a direct sum. Okay, so you see that I could write C3 as the direct sum of three subspaces, and I know that each of these subspaces are invariant. Okay, now the dimension of this subspace is one, dimension of this one is one, and dimension of this one is one. Okay, that means that I can actually find a simple representation for this matrix, which is, which is diagonal, as we talked before. Okay? So now let us try to, let us try to do this. All right? So how, how should I choose my P matrix? This P matrix should be chosen out of the basis vectors of these subspaces. The basis vector for the first subspace is 1, 1, 0. The basis vector for the second subspace is 0, 1, 0, and the basis vector for the third subspace is 0, 1, 1. Okay? And then I need to calculate A bar, which is, which is equal to P inverse AP. And remember, we never use this equation in this form because of the P inverse. Instead, I write this equation as P times A bar is A times P. Okay? Now let me write P here, 110, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, times A bar, I will find what A bar is, so this is my P, and this is A bar, and it is, I have A, A is this one, minus 1, minus 1, 0, 0, 2, 0, 0, 1, 3, and P is the same matrix, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, and 0, 1, 1. Okay, so you see that I can make the multiplication on the right here. So that is going to be, if I multiply this matrix with the first column here, I will sum the first two, first two columns here. Sorry, I'm, I have written this wrong. So I would, I would have here, if I sum these first two columns, I would have 1, 1, 0 here. And if I multiply this matrix A, this is A, and this is my P. If I multi multiply A with the second column, I will take the second column of A, 0, 2, 0. And if I multiply P with the third column, the, if I multiply A with the third column here, I will sum the last two columns, 0, 3, 3. Okay? Now here is what I'm, what I'm going to do. So now, in order to be able to find the first column of A bar, I will express 1, 1, 0 as a linear combination of the columns of, uh, columns of P. Okay? The, if I express 1, 1, 0 as a linear combination of the columns of P, the coefficients would be 1, 0, 0. Okay, so that is going to be my first column for A bar. If I express 0 to 0 as a linear combination of the columns here, I would have here just 0 to 0 coefficients. These coefficients would be the second column of A bar. And finally, if I express 0, 3, 3 as a linear combination of the columns of P, that is going to, the coefficients would be 0, 0, 3. This is going to be the third column 
of A bar. So you see that A bar here is again a block diagonal, but the blocks are one by one because the dimensions of these null spaces were just equal to one and these null spaces were invariant under A. Okay? So, and you see that these are nothing but the eigenvalues, all right? So the diagonal elements are nothing but the eigenvalues. So in this case, what was special about this, this case so that we could obtain a diagonal representation? In this case, the specific thing about this matrix was that all eigenvalues were distinct. So we have eigenvalues lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda n for any matrix and we have n eigenvalues for an n by n matrix and we see that no eigenvalues are repeated for this matrix. Okay? So that means that lambda i is not equal to lambda j when i is not equal to j. This is the condition for distinct eigenvalue case. When the matrix does not have any repeated eigenvalue, in that case we say that the matrix has distinct eigenvalues and that is the condition that has to be satisfied. Eigenvalue i should be different than the eigenvalue j when i is different, different than j. Okay? So this was the, just an illustration of this distinct eigenvalue case. And now we're going to write the general theorem for this specific case. All right? So I have a theorem. Let A be an n by n matrix with distinct eigenvalues. With distinct eigenvalues. These eigenvalues are lambda 1, lambda 2, going until lambda n. Okay? And the condition is lambda i is not equal to lambda j when i is not equal to j, okay? Then, the set of eigenvectors, the set of eigenvectors, for each eigenvalue, I know that there is at least one linearly independent eigenvector, okay? So I would have for the set of eigenvectors, e1 to en, form a linearly independent set form a linearly independent set, okay? And I have here, hence, I would have Cn as the direct sum of these eigenspaces, lambda 1 identity, plus A minus lambda 2 identity, going until a minus lambda n identity. Okay? And in this case, the dimensions are all one. Okay? Because these vectors would contain the eigenvectors corresponding to these eigenvalues. And here, the interesting thing is also, now space of A minus lambda i identity is nothing but the span of the i-th eigenvector, okay? That is, that is our space, or the eigenspace. And now I can write the important conclusion from this. We have, we can actually write Cn, the overall space, as the direct sum of n invariant spaces with dimension 1, okay? And in that case, we know that the matrix A should have a diagonal representation. And having a diagonal representation means that A is diagonalizable, okay? Since 
null space of a minus lambda i identity is invariant under a a has a diagonal representation a has a diagonal representation okay but this means that a is diagonalizable okay and this new representation a bar is diagonal and it is composed of the eigenvalues on its main diagonal and zero everywhere else and we know that this a bar is nothing but p inverse a p our famous formula and this p matrix is composed of the basis vectors of these null spaces these eigenspaces and these are nothing but the eigenvectors e1 e2 going until en that is the our invertible basis change matrix okay we have already seen an application of this this theorem so now instead i will just try to prove some parts of this theorem okay again i will not be able to give you the general proof but i will only give you the sketch of the proof and you would have to generalize the the ideas that i give in order to be able to get a complete proof or a proper proof for this theorem so the thing that i'm going to try to show you the proof is that the set of eigenvectors form a linearly independent set okay so here let us look at the sketch of the proof so i will start this this proof like thing with, by selecting n is equal to 3 as soon as I set n equals to 3, I know that this is not going to be a, a proof of this theorem. Because the, the theorem does not contain any specific value for n. n should be general. But in order to be able to have some simple calculations here, I will assume n is equal to 3. So you would have to repeat these calculations for a general n in order to be able to get uh, a a, a complete proof, an actual proof for this, for that statement. The set of eigenvectors form a linearly independent set. So in this case, A is going to be in C, C3, and it would have three distinct eigenvalues, lambda 1, lambda 2, and lambda 3. Okay? And for each of the eigenvalues, I would have at least one eigenvector, E1, E2, E3, okay? The task is here to prove that these eigenvectors are actually linearly independent, okay? So in order to be able to prove linear independence, I will write this linear combination, alpha 1, E1, plus alpha 2, E2, plus alpha 3, E3, and I will equate the result to zero. If I can find alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3, which are non-zero, at least one of them non-zero, then these three vectors would be linearly dependent. If I can prove, on the other hand, that all alphas, alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3, they need to be equal to zero if this equation is satisfied, then I can say that these three eigenvectors are linearly independent. So our aim here is going to be to prove that alpha 1, alpha 2, and alpha 3 are all equal to zero, since we want to show that the set of eigenvectors are linearly independent. Okay? So in the in the proof of uh, in the in while trying to show that alpha 1 alpha 2 alpha 3 are equal to 0 I will use the multiplications of the following form a minus lambda i identity times the jth eigenvector what would be such a matrix vector multiplication let us try to look at this this is a minus lambda i identity and I have the jth eigenvector here all right. 
So here, if i and j are the same, what should be this multiplication? If I have i and j, if they are equal, what would be such a multiplication? I know that the eigenvector ei is inside the null space of this matrix. So instead of ej here, if I write here ei, then I would have just zero. Because the, this is the eigenspace matrix, null space of this matrix is the eigenspace for the i-th eigenvalue, and that eigenvector ei should be inside the null space of this matrix. Okay? So when i is equal to j, I know that this multiplication is zero. But what about the case when i is not equal to j? So now let us try to show, uh, e expand this product here. a times ej minus lambda i identity ej. Okay? I know that identity times ej is going to be ej itself. And what about a times ej? ej is an eigenvector corresponding to the eigenvalue lambda j. So this is going to be lambda j times ej. And since, since this product i e j is e j, this is going to be lambda i e j. Okay? So this is going to be lambda j e j minus lambda i e j. Okay? And when I take e j parentheses here, I would have lambda j minus lambda i times e j. Okay? So that is this multiplication. So you see here that when i is equal to j, indeed this, this product is equal to zero because lambda i minus lambda i would be zero in that case and i would have just zero in the result. But if i is not equal to j, then I'm subtracting lambda j from lambda i and multiplying it with ej. Okay? So now I will go back to the, to the proof here, or the kind of proof. So here I have this equation, and from this equation I need to show that alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3 are all equal to 0. Now what I'm going to do is that I will start with this equation, alpha 1 e1 plus alpha 2 e2 plus alpha 3 e3 is equal to 0. And I will multiply both sides of this equation. The, on, on both sides I would have vectors. This is my zero vector and these are a linear combination of the vectors. So I would have, I would multiply both sides with the matrix A minus lambda 1 identity from the left. Okay? multiply both sides of this equation with the matrix A minus lambda 1 identity from the left. So then what am I going to obtain? Alpha 1, A minus lambda 1 identity E1, plus alpha 2, A minus lambda 1 identity E2, plus alpha 3, A minus lambda 1 identity E3, which is going to be this matrix times the zero vector. But that is still zero. Okay. So I would have this equation then. <clears throat> I know that E1 is in the null space of this matrix. So here I is equal to J in that multiplication. That means that this thing is equal to the zero vector. So I would write the first term is actually disappearing here. So I would have alpha 2. And this is going to be, according to that calculation, this is going to be lambda 2 minus lambda 1 E2 plus alpha 3, and this is going to be lambda 3 minus lambda 1, E3, that is equal to 0. Okay? So you see that by multiplying with this matrix, I got rid of one of the terms, and I would have some coefficients here. What can you say about these coefficients? Can these coefficients be equal to 0? Lambda, three, lambda 2 minus lambda 1, or lambda 3 minus lambda 1. Can these coefficients be equal to zero? Here, we are working with a matrix with distinct eigenvalues. As a result, these differences should be non-zero quantities. Okay? They cannot be equal to zero. So now I'm going to continue my proof by multiplying both sides of this equation with the matrix A minus lambda 2 identity. Okay? <clears throat> I can easily do that. So let us do this. Alpha 2, 
lambda 2 minus lambda 1. These are just scalars. I can take them in the, into the front. So a minus lambda 2 identity, and I would have e2 here, plus alpha 3, lambda 3 minus lambda 1, and I have a minus lambda 2 identity, and I would here put e3, and I have this matrix times 0, which is just 0. Okay? So now let us look at the terms here. This matrix vector multiplication is just going to be 0. So this term is going to disappear. <clears throat> and what about this one? So let us write this. Alpha 3, lambda 3 minus lambda 1. And this multiplication is going to be just lambda 3 minus lambda 2, according to that calculation, E3. OK? <clears throat> Which is equal to the 0 vector. So now what can we say about these terms? The eigenvector is by definition a non-zero vector. Okay? Remember the definition of an eigenvector, it's a non-zero vector satisfying the eigenvalue eigenvector equation. So this is not the zero vector. <coughs> okay? And this scalar is not equal to zero. And this scalar is not equal to zero because we have the, an, a matrix with distinct eigenvalues. So lambda 3 is not equal to lambda 1, therefore this term is not zero. And this term is not zero. Lambda 2 is not equal to lambda 3. And finally the eigenvector is not equal to zero. But this, the overall multiplication should be the zero vector. Okay? What is our conclusion in this case? There is only the one possibility of this equation holding here, and that, that possibility is that this alpha 3 should be equal to 0. Okay? And now what about, what about the other ones? So, after obtaining alpha 3 is equal to 0, I can go back to the earlier, one of the earlier equations here. So I can substitute alpha 3 is equal to 0, then this term is going to disappear, and I would have this term should be equal to 0. Eigenvector is non-zero, E2 is non-zero, and this difference of eigenvalues is non-zero, so alpha 2 should be equal to 0. And then I'm going to go back uh, one, one equation uh, more, and then I would substitute alpha 2, alpha 3 is equal to 0. Then I, I need to have alpha 1 times E1 equals to 0. But that is going to be meaning that alpha 1 should be equal to 0, because E1 is a non-zero vector. So we, this actually completes the proof that these three eigenvectors should be linearly, linearly independent. Okay? And if these eigenvectors are linearly independent, then we know that these null spaces, when, when I obtain a direct sum of them, I need to obtain the overall space. So now let me, so this completes the sketch of the proof here. So maybe I shouldn't, I shouldn't dignify this by writing here uh, just QED because this was not an actual proof. So in order to be able to prove this thing, this thing for the general case, for the theorem, you would, have, you would have to add here the terms alpha 4 E4 plus going until alpha N E N. Okay? And then you need to repeat all of these operations. Actually, you have to do these multiplications n minus 1 times okay? with, di with different eigenvalues. And that would be a complete proof. And in that case, when you show that all of the alphas are equal to 0, you can write there QED. I will not write here QED. So then we have seen that these eigenvectors form a linearly independent set. As a result, they would span the overall space Cn. And that is going to mean that the, these null spaces, A1 minus, sorry, A minus lambda 1 identity, going until null space A minus lambda n identity, their direct sum would be just Cn, okay? And then we are going to be putting this P here 
And that would be composed of these linearly independent eigenvectors, which are the basis vectors for these null spaces, which have dimension 1. Okay? And now let us look at this diagonal representation, how we can obtain it. A bar is equal to P inverse AP, and this is my P. Remember, I'm not using this equation in this form at all. P times A bar is equal to A times P. This is the equation form that I would like to use. Now, let us write P times A bar. So I would have my P here, which is the eigenvector matrix, EN. And this is my A bar. And I would have A, and I have the P again, EN, E2, EN. Okay. So now let us try to find A bar here. So this is A bar, and this is P, and this is P. The first column of this multiplication, A times the first column, it is going to be A times E1. But A times E1 is nothing but lambda 1 times E1. Okay? So on the right hand side, if I do this multiplication here, I would have AE1, AE2, going until AEN. This multiplication is equal to this. So I would put into the columns of the multiplication the A times the eigenvectors. But I know that these are nothing but lambda1, E1, lambda2, E2, going until lambda n, En. Okay? So the first column on the right hand side is lambda 1 times E1. Now in order to be able to find the first column of A bar, I need to express lambda 1 E1 in terms of the columns of P. Okay? Express lambda 1 E1 as a linear combination of the columns of P and write the coefficients into the first column of A bar. Okay? But this is really trivial because lambda 1 E1 is lambda 1 times the first column and 0 times the other column summed. Okay? So I would just have the first column of A bar would be this. And then the second column is lambda 2 E2. Express lambda 2 E2 as a linear combination of the columns of P. But the coefficients then would be 0 lambda 2 and 0 0 everywhere else. 0 lambda 2 going on and I, have, I will have zeros and zeros everywhere else. Okay? So this is going to continue in this manner and I would have a diagonal A bar matrix and zeros everywhere else. Okay? So this is, this is why we are obtaining, we are obtaining a, a diagonal matrix representation because these columns here on the right hand side I can always express them as a, as a linear combination of the columns here with only one non-zero coefficient and that non-zero coefficient turns out to be the eigenvalue in each case. Okay? So in that case, we have a diagonal representation. Actually, this, this thing is, is true even when the matrix is, uh, the eigenvalues of the matrix really are not distinct. When we have n linearly independent eigenvectors for a matrix, we can always obtain such a diagonal representation. Even when we don't have the matrix with distinct eigenvalues. If we have n linearly independent eigenvectors, we can always form such a P matrix and we can always diagonalize this matrix. So the sufficient and necessary condition for the diagonalizability of a matrix is nothing but there, needs, there need to exist n linearly independent eigenvectors. Okay? If a matrix has n linearly independent eigenvectors, then that matrix is diagonalizable. And if a matrix is diagonalizable, then that matrix should have n linearly independent eigenvectors. The case with distinct eigenvalues is, is an important case that we can actually show this quite, quite easily. Okay? So we have seen the meaning of the theorem, and I have already illustrated the theorem on an example. Now in, this, uh, in the remaining parts of this lecture, I will talk about the characteristic polynomial. What would be the general case? So in the distinct eigenvalue case, we have the following. Distinct 
eigenvalue case, this d of s would be si minus a and it would be just this s minus lambda 1 s minus lambda 2 going until s minus lambda n okay so this is the distinct eigenvalue case so the characteristic polynomial is the multiplication of n first order terms and none of the terms are are the same in general we would have some repeated eigenvalues so for example, lambda 1 can be equal to lambda 2. And in, in the general case, general case with repeated eigenvalues. Of course, it is, it is also in this case, but some of the terms might be the same in that case. Okay? And then I can combine those terms together into a single factor. So I have d of s is equal to s minus lambda 1 to the power r1. This is the multiplicity of this eigenvalue lambda 1 in the characteristic polynomial. s minus lambda 2 to the power r2 going until s minus lambda k to the power rk. Okay? So I have k distinct eigenvalues and they are repeated with the, with the powers r1, r2 going until rk. Here I need to make sure that in total the characteristic polynomial is an nth order polynomial. What does that mean for these powers? In general these powers should be summing to n. Okay? Because the characteristic polynomial is an nth order polynomial. Okay? So this is the general case with repeated eigenvalues. The characteristic polynomial would be looking like this, with some eigenvalues repeated. Okay? <clears throat> so what did we see in this lecture? In this lecture we have seen that if you have distinct eigenvalues, then the matrix is diagonalizable. So this is P implies Q. P is the statement the matrix has distinct eigenvalues. Q is the statement that the matrix is diagonalizable. Okay? Do you think the reverse of this implication would be correct? What does that mean? Do you think I have Q implies P? This is the reverse implication. Do you think the reverse implication would be correct? So what does that mean? If the matrix is diagonalizable, do you think I can say that the matrix has distinct eigenvalues? The theorem in this lecture has, has proven that if we have distinct eigenvalues, then we have a diagonalizable matrix. We can obtain a diagonal representation for that matrix. Now I'm asking the question, if the matrix that you are working with is diagonalizable, then do you think you would always have distinct eigenvalues in this case? The answer to this question is unfortunately no. So reverse of this statement really would not be correct. I can easily give you a counterexample. Suppose that your A is, is this one. 2, 2, 1. What is the characteristic polynomial? D of S, a diagonal matrix, the eigenvalues are always the diagonal elements. Try to show this. For a diagonal matrix, the eigenvalues are always the diagonal elements. So D of S would be S minus 2 square and S minus 1. So we see that one of the eigenvalues is re repeated. Okay? But do you think this matrix is diagonalizable? 
This matrix is already diagonal. Okay, a diagonal, a diagonal matrix is trivially diagonalizable. If I choose the P, P matrix, which is the identity matrix, then a bar is going to be identity inverse. This is my P inverse times A times identity, and this is my P. Then you see that A bar is equal to A, so we have a diagonal representation. Okay, so this matrix is trivially diagonalizable, but you see that it has repeated eigenvalues. Therefore, if I have a diagonalizable matrix, it is not really true that I would always have distinct eigenvalues. Okay, so this implication is completely incorrect. Okay, it is not. It's not correct. And a more, even more trivial example is the identity matrix. A is one 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 zero 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 zero. Do you think this matrix is diagonalizable? Yes, of course, this is already a diagonal matrix, so it is trivially diagonalizable. And I really do not have to do anything in order to be able to diagonalize this. But what about the, its characteristic polynomial, D of S? The eigenvalues of a diagonal matrix are always the diagonal elements, so the characteristic polynomial is S minus 1 cube. So obviously, the eigenvalue 1 is repeated here three times. So we can have diagonalizable matrices with repeated eigenvalues. So really you cannot say a matrix is diagonalizable if and only if it has distinct eigenvalues. That implication would not be correct. That double-sided implication would not be correct. We only have one-sided impl implication here. Distinct eigenvalues result in diagonalizable matrices. But the reverse implication would not be correct at all. But you know that from, from your logic, uh, logic knowledge that there really, exists, there really exists an equivalent implication to this one. P implies Q. There is an equivalent implication to this true fact. What is that implication? What is equivalent to P implies Q? We know that the implication P implies Q is equivalent to Q complement implies P complement. Okay? These two implications would be correct. So there, there exists an equivalent implication to this one. Distinct eigenvalues implies diagonalizable. And what is that going to be? So I have Q complement implies P complement. What is Q complement? If a matrix is not diagonalizable, then what is P complement? The matrix will not have distinct eigenvalues. Matrix does not have distinct eigenvalues. Okay? So this is, this is really a perfectly correct implication. So non-diagonalizable matrices would always have repeated eigenvalues. Because when the matrix does not have repeated eigenvalues, then it has distinct eigenvalues and we would have a diagonalizable matrix. But if we have a non-diagonalizable matrix, that matrix would always have some repeated eigenvalues. Okay? But this really doesn't mean that all diagonalizable matrices have distinct eigenvalues. There might be matrices with repeated eigenvalues which are still diagonalizable. Okay? So here I will just finish this lecture with, a, with an interesting, interesting fact. And that is going to be the introduction to the, to the next lecture. So here is what I'm going to do. I really like this matrix a lot, and I really like illustrating things on this matrix a lot. Okay? So what was the characteristic polynomial of this one? S i minus a is equal to s minus two, s minus two, minus one, and minus one. Okay? So the characteristic polynomial is d of s is equal to s minus 2 square minus 1, so s square minus 4s plus 4 minus 1, which is 3. So this is my characteristic polynomial, okay? So this is 
characteristic polynomial. I have told you somewhere in this lecture that there is also a characteristic equation, which is d of s is equal to 0. This is the characteristic equation. Okay. Now here I'm going to, and the characteristic equation, if I write d of s here, it is s squared minus 4s plus 3 is equal to 0. Okay. So now I'm going to do something interesting. Instead of s, I'm going to substitute a, the matrix itself. Okay. And it is going to be a squared minus 4a plus 3. Is, it, is this thing correct? The thing that I have written, do you think it is correct? It is not correct because here 3 is a scalar and A is a matrix. So I'm here trying to sum a scalar with a matrix. Okay? So here I need to, instead of 3, I need to write something. This is 3 times 1 and this is S to the 1. This is S to the 0, which is 1. So here instead of 3, I need to write 3 identity. Okay, so only in that case this would be correct. A squared minus 4A plus 3 identity. Okay, so let me try to calculate this thing. So I have A squared, 2, 2, 1, 1. A multiplied with itself, it is this one. Minus 4 times A, 2, 2, 1, 1. Plus 3 times identity. This matrix, okay. So now let me, let me calculate those terms. So here, this thing is going, to, is going to give me 5 here. 5. And then I would have 4, 4, 5 here. Minus, this is going to be 8, 4, 4, 8. And I would have plus 3, 3, 0, 0. Okay? So now let me sum all of the terms. 5 minus 8 plus 3, 0. 4 minus 4 plus 0, 0. 4 minus 4 plus 0, 0. 5 minus 8 plus 3, 0. Okay? So you see that interestingly, a square minus 4a plus 3 identity is nothing but a 2 by 2, 0 matrix. Okay? So this interesting fact actually is satisfied by all matrices, okay? All square matrices would satisfy such a property. When you write their characteristic equation, if you substitute A, you would see that the characteristic equation is satisfied by the matrix A, okay? This interesting fact has really lots of implications that we are going to be using is called, uh, th th this interesting fact is called in mathematics as the Cayley-Hamilton theorem, which is going to be the topic of our next lecture. But that's all for this one. Thank you again for watching. Bye-bye.